So, on to the main event. Uh, I'd like to introduce Captain Tracy Welch, um, over 22,000 hours. I'm going to leave it at that because she's going to give an introduction. So, thank you so much for being here. experiences and hours and stories in this room, and I am just honored that I get to tell mine. So thank you for having me, John. Thank you for inviting me. And um, Abby, my daughter, is going to be helping with the audiovisual. Thank you. And it's because of Abby and general aviation that I'm involved with this group. So actually, I'm writing on her shirt today. So I'm glad to do that. So I've been flying for 41 years. Um, 34 years ago, America hired me to fly, and um, I'm going to spare you the math. I'm going to wow. keep going. I still am thrilled that they pay me to fly their airplanes. In fact, that is me in that airplane on uh, 737 landing south in DCA before we paint, changed the paint job. But, um, so anyway, I have been based in Washington, D.C. my whole career, and as you'll hear, I've been at it, in and out of D.C. many, many times. I currently fly the 737. We have the 800s and the Max. And so, how this is going to go, I outlined what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you flying stories. A lot of them are local here, flying, because this is where my flying started and continues in chronological order of my experiences going up to my Hague American Airlines career. Then I'm going to share some fun photos from the flight deck. I enjoy seeing all the Facebook photos, so I'll show you mine. And then I'm going to give you a plug about a book that I'm a contributing author. And then walk away towards a wisdom, as any form of flight instructor would want to do. So anyway, my story starts a hundred years ago, in 1990. Truly, on Hoover Field, which is a field where the Pentagon used to be, this is my grandmother. She took an airplane ride for 30 minutes in a, um, a Canadian Curtis and had that photo. She always wanted to be a pilot, but she said, quote, I was born before my time. So. I recently looked in the back of the photo, and she wrote on it, the pilot was E. Hamilton Lee. So I looked him up. Sure enough, I found him in the internet, and he is quoted as saying, you might have heard this, there are old pilots and bold pilots, but there are no old bold pilots. And sure enough, he went on to retire the number one pilot at United Airlines. So, while well, she wanted to fly and she couldn't, both of her sons became um, pilots. My dad was a World War II Navy aviator, and he ended up finishing up his naval career in the reserves at the Anacostia Naval Air Station. So across from National Airport, there used to be a runway until 1962. And that's my dad, the tall one right there. That's where Abby gets her pilot. And so, so the officer and the pilots are down there, the illicit guys are up there. So in the Cold War, they, they flew these airplanes over the Atlantic looking for submarines. And he retired in 62 when the air bill shut down. So he, commercially, though, he flew for Capital Airlines. Capital Airlines was a regional airline in the Washington, D.C. area. He started his DC threes there. And then they got bought out by United. So this is my dad in the front of a 737, which is kind of cool because that's what I fly. So if I ever can fly a 737, I've got a jet bridge attached to it, I'd like to recreate that photo. But I mean, we don't even have the stairs on our airplanes anymore. But um, so his career is pretty amazing. It's, he went from flying a DC-3 commercially and he retired on the 747, which is a big span of uh, different kind of equipment. But at Capital Airlines, that's when he met my mother, who was a hostess. <laughs> my mom was not shy. She introduced herself earlier. Lee Fryer, I was going to introduce her now. Uh, but interesting, back, back in the 1950s, my mother soloed an airplane. Wow. So, 
scared me to death. <laughs> so my story starts when I was 12 years old. My dad ran an airplane at an airport called Whiskey Nine. Anybody familiar with that? Whiskey Nine was the identifier of Leesburg before it became KJYO. So he ran an airplane out of Leesburg, took me for an airplane ride, let me fly from the right seat and said, you like it? I said, yeah. He goes, okay, well, when you're 16 and can drive yourself to the airport, you can take flying lessons. Because he was tired of driving me around to all my dancing classes. Because up until that point, I was going to be a rock app. But <laughs> I shifted gears and I thought this career has a little more longevity to it. So here I am. So when I was 16, I went out to an airport that had the identifier Whiskey 10. Anybody familiar with that one? That's Manassas. So Manassas Airport, this is uh, on a crosswind, had one runway, and it was a unicom field. It was not a tire, tire, tower field. I was a nervous wreck, and I had to go to Charlottesville and talk on the radio. <laughs> but um, so I got my private pilot license. Colgan Airways back then had a flight school, got my private, went away to college, Got my degree, got the rest of my ratings, and my first job out of college was banner towing. <laughs> so it was fun going through these photos for the slide. I haven't seen them in years. It was interesting. I was advertising a Queen concert. So just after seeing Bohemian Rhapsody, I thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> but I really didn't pay much attention to what I was flying around there. But the um, operation, if you've never seen banner towing, it's kind of cool. So these were, now they had printed signs, but the ground crew had to put together those letters and spell them out. They laid down on a field on the ground, the rope was connected over two poles, and then my company flew on a uh, Cessna 172, which is a very efficient, but I knew how to fly it. The door was off the airplane. In case we ditched in the ocean, the owner said I could get out more quickly, and then he made me wear a bicycle helmet, a motorcycle helmet, in case I crashed. So, uh, so you take off from the field, and there is a little latch on the back of the bottom of the fuselage with a rope that comes around into the cockpit. So you take off, you go in downwind, throw the physically throw the hook out, and you come around, and then you come down. And you try to time it so that you pitch up and catch the um, catch the wire, and then you quickly, or you don't stall, you put the nose over. And then you know if you get it, because it's a big drag on the airplane. And you know if you miss it, because whoo, you keep going. <laughs> so then you climb up to 1,000 feet above the people, go down over the ocean, fly the banner, climb back up to 1,000 feet, come in, you get over the field. There was a lever in the cockpit. You pull the lever, and that little latch would open. The banner would float to the ground, and you'd come back in and land. So it was in a grass strip. This is for Hobart Airport. That airport doesn't exist anymore. So got to do a lot of soft field takeoff and landings. And um, so bless my mother for letting me do it because it was kind of dangerous. And I would not let my daughter do banners. <laughs> but the, the biggest danger on this one, on the other side of the field, there was a lone trailer. And every once in a while, the owner there, he didn't like us flying, so he'd get a shotgun out and shoot at us. <laughs> that, that was a little bit of a threat. So the next time we go, uh, yeah. so the next time I go down to Ocean City, Maryland, and there's a cute little, there's a little house that's a terminal there. It's not there anymore. But um, and both of these jobs, you were basically the jack of all trades when you flew there. You did flight instructing, you did sightseeing rides, you did charter, you did banner towing, you just did whatever walked in the door. So uh, the big operation here, the big operation was flying the Cherokee Six. So the Cherokee 6 Resort Airlines is the name of it. They had a charter to Baltimore, one of the missions on Friday afternoon. I go to BWI, take all the seats out of the airplane, fill it up with the Baltimore Sun Sunday inserts. So take as much weight as you could take in that thing, and then you fly back over, take it to Ocean City, and then it'd be there for Sunday to put in the Sunday paper. That's back when we read real papers. So another mission we would do is we would fly charter between DCA and Ocean City and BWI in Ocean City. So um, that's the that's the um, the cop that's the cockpit there mm. of the um, Cherokee Six. Notice round dials. There's going to be a theme here of round dials. Um, 
So you go into DCA, and back then there wasn't uh, Class Bravo airspace. It was called the TCA. It was like upside down wedding cake, but you still needed mode C to go in there. So you fly in there and you pack a Washington approach. There wasn't Potomac yet. Washington approach, and you say outside the area, do you get clearance to go in there? Okay, squawk so and so. Hey, I don't see your mode C. Oh, okay, uh oh, must not be working. So, okay, well, as long as you keep your speeds up and do what we say, you're welcome to come in. So I'm going in there. The second time I land, hey, Resort, is your mode C not working in? Oh, I guess not. Third time, oh, just come on in. My company never had mode C in that airplane. <laughs> but the controllers got to know my voice and call sign and knew I could do whatever they wanted to do. And so that's what we did. So the company doesn't exist anymore, so we don't have to, we don't have to find them now. Um, so my next job was another single engine airplane. Assessment 206 out of Manassas Airport, once again, took the seats out of the airplane because I was hired to fly into this airport. Who recognizes it? Hot Springs. Hot Springs, right. So the company flew a Beach 99 from Washington National to Hot Springs. I used to have golfers there to go to the resort. But the Beach 99 couldn't handle all the golf clubs. So I was hired to put the golf clubs in the 206, follow along behind the B-99, oh. and deliver golf clubs to Hot Springs. <laughs> so that's what I did. And at the time, it was the highest commercially served airport east of the Mississippi. So just on this past Saturday, I was flying over, and I took another picture of oh, yeah. Hot Springs. Yeah. But my new favorite Hot Springs story is I was flying over the other day like this, and I realized Abby's on a cross country to Hot Springs today. So I dial in the Unicom and I found her. Oh. We talked to each other. That was really kind of neat. Awesome. And um, the other day I did talk to her at the Leesburg Airport. I think I scared the controller because I said, Leesburg Tower, this is American so and so. Oh crap, we're getting a 737. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, no, no. If you have a Cessna on frequency, just tell her her mother says hi. And <laughs> she's on ground control now. I'll tell her to go to Tower. So I even figured out, why are they switching me to Tower while I'm at the ramp? <laughs> so, I got So I end up flying for. Um, Beach 99s for Colgan Airways. So that's a Beach 99. Yeah. It was a twin engine turboprop airplane. Um, the interior of it was uh, 15 passengers. He had a little curtain up there. There was no flight attendant. And then the next picture, there's a uh, this here's like the cockpit. There's no no flight director, no autopilot, not pressurized. <coughs> but yet I still have my round guidance. Okay. So the operation there was interesting. It was based in Manassas, Virginia at the time, and in the morning you'd show up to work and ferry the airplane to Dulles or National. And then you'd pick up your people and go on your route, whether it's the kids in New York, being up in New York, Hot Springs, wherever you went. And then when you finish, the afternoon crew would come in, because we didn't do layovers. The, uh, the afternoon crew would drive the cars to Manassas, and they would hop in, it was VFR, they'd hop in a Cessna fly over to DCA to relieve the crew, and then the morning crew, we'd get in the airplane and fly back to Manassas to get our cars to go home. So that was actually kind of fun. Um, at the time, Dulles was very underutilized. So I can remember taking off, remember Manassas is a Unicom field, getting a clearance. You could talk to Washington Approach and get your clearance, and maybe it was activated, if you take off in five minutes or activated in the air. So they activated the flight plan while we were on the ground, and they said, Colgan, you are clear for the approach. You are clear to land. You are clear to taxi to your gate. <laughs> we were like the only show in town going over there. You can show the next slide. And so we'd pull up. This is the old terminal. There's only one terminal back then. There's the old tower. So you just pull up right there and get your people on and off. Another cool Dulles story is the parallel runway 3012, the parallel taxiway. On the taxiway, there used to be a runway markings. And I actually got to land on that one time. So I hope someone could land on the taxiway that was really kind of a runway. So uh, I was going to look for an aerial shot of it. 
online and Saturday and flew out of Baltimore and I said, I'll take my own photo. So I took this photo on Saturday and it's right here on the taxiway that parallels 30 that there used to be a runway right there in the uh, markings of the taxiway. So um, let's see. Oh, also the same day, that's out my left side. And so I took Leesburg out the right side. I know a lot of you guys posted pictures um, from Friday's um, snow. So this is Saturday, the day later snow picture from 20 to a flight level 220. So, um, so after an aggressive application process, which is a whole story in itself, um, I ended up getting an interview at American Airlines. So. Um, is a three-part interview, and one of them is to fly the simulator to 707. So I came home from the simulator flight, told my dad, yeah, I did really well, but something kept getting in my way. He goes, oh, that's a flight director, and it doesn't get in your way. It's a good thing. So I had never seen a flight director before. So that was good. So I'm hired to fly American Airlines, and the starting position back then was flight engineer on the um, 727. So there I am, and that's a 727. So it was fun. I really enjoyed doing all the switches, managing the systems. Now they all take care of themselves. They got to put generators online, manage the fuel. It was, I actually really enjoyed it. You were busier than the first office. You know, you were actually much busier. Yeah. I see my colleagues back there kicking yeah. <laughs> So um, I had great fun doing that. And my dad gave me a piece of advice. Uh, piece of advice. He goes, okay. Sit back there in the engineer seat with your E6B, it's called the whiz wheel, and just start moving it. The captain will look back, he'll have no idea what you're doing and never ask you another question. <laughs> you don't use them anymore. So I happen to be the first woman based in Washington, D.C. with American Airlines. And then my very, very, always have to on your first flight. Your very, like your first 100 hours as captain, everything happens. But the very first flight, it was a Palm Beach layover. So coming out of Palm Beach, and oh, oh by the way, the, yeah, the simulators weren't quite as good as they are now. So I remember hearing, oh, when the flaps come up, you're going to see the hydraulic system kind of fluctuate, and then they, so that's a little different than the simulator. So just look for that. So there'll be some differences when you fly out. So we're flying out of Palm Beach after my first layover, and I'm watching that hydraulic system, looking for the bump but it keeps going down. So I tapped the first officer and I said, is that normal? And he goes, no, it's not normal. <laughs> so we're losing system A hydraulics. So back then they were called red box items, memory items, so you flip off all the switches and the, and so the captain, there's a hurricane coming into Palm Beach, the weather was crappy. And so there's redundant systems. We have assisted A, assisted B, and so airplane was control. Well, he presses on to Dallas Fort Worth. So the checklist is sort of a troubleshooting checklist. By the time you do go through the long checklist, the fluid has just dumped. We've done. No more system A hydraulic fluid. And the redundant system for putting the landing gear down was manual extension. And guess who gets to do that? The flight engineer. So there's a lever in the flight deck that you, actually then it was the cockpit, yeah, that, you, uh, that you put the gear down. But now to verify that it's down, you have to go in the back of the airplane, and there's a viewing port in the floor underneath the carpet. So you actually open up this viewing port, and there's two red uh, pieces of tape. One piece of tape. And then you put the gear down and the other red piece of tape, and if all three matches up in the line, when you're looking down in the viewing port, your gear is down the box. So, okay, where's the viewing port? Where's that viewing port? Okay, so I have to go back. Okay, I think it was row so-and-so. Take two steps back. So I go to the back, put my hat on, with my tools, because you have, back then, engineers carried tools, and I screw that, now they're weapons. But you know, you have to so, you go to the back of the, I go to that, I go to that seat, take my one, two steps, like I've been told to do, I start to bend over, I'm not looking at anybody, I'm focused on this job. There is a passenger in the middle seat, reading a book, and goes like this, he goes, forward. He announced the word forward. Because I was going to start ripping up and going back. So I go, take one step like this, 
go down, open the port, <coughs> rip up the carpet, and there was the viewing port. Oh, I have no idea who he was to this day, but I'm very grateful for him. <laughs> so, it was down in, down in red, I guess I can't say green, down in green, down in red skirts, so we got the land. That was no problem. So, um, do, 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 do. interesting thing about American Airlines operations, actually DCA operations back then, you couldn't, Dulles was still underutilized. So you couldn't fly out of DCA to places more than, and I may have this number wrong, but you guys can correct me, 1,200 miles away, I think it was. So our hub was in Dallas, Fort Worth. So we would fly from DCA to Dullus, put the aft stairs down, I'd get out as an engineer, walk around and do the pre-flight, get back in, load up the stairs, and we'd fly off to Dallas Fort Worth. So here I am, still hopping around the local airports with the major airline. <laughs> the local airports here. So uh, that was kind of fun. That didn't last for long. There were exceptions made for that rule. Okay, so now it's December 1986, and two other women have come into Washington, D.C. And one of the women just made captain because we're a junior base, and her name is Beverly Bass. So I'm going to go on a side note tangent here. Some of you may have heard of Beverly, but on September 11th, 2001, the FAA shut down the American airspace. All the European flights had to land somewhere. They all landed up in Canada. Uh, in Canada. So in um, Gander, Newfoundland, they had an extra 6,500 people that day of a town of 10,000. So Come From Away is a musical. It's on Broadway, there's a traveling show, it's in London, it's in Toronto, they're making a movie out of it. It's a true story about this event, about Gander. And Beverly Bass was a triple seven captain that day that landed there, and the main character in this musical is Beverly. It's a fabulous oh, wow. musical, I highly recommend it. It's up in New York right now. So anyway, back to December. 1986, I was living with my parents in Vienna, Virginia, and I invited the two other women, my mom let me invite the two other women because they weren't local, to Christmas dinner. So there we were at the Christmas dinner table, my mom, my dad, my brother, myself, Beverly, Terry. Beverly looks around the table and says, oh my God, we have an all-female crew here. I'm a captain. Terry was the first, t Beverly was a captain. Beverly's the first officer. I'm, I'm a flight engineer. So we start doing some trip trading and working with crew schedule, and we planned the first all-female crew for a major airline. Oh, right at my mother's dinner Christmas dinner. So people think the company put that together. We did. It would have happened. It would have been inevitable. But, um, I had flown with all female crew. Colgan and other airlines had done it, but this was major. You know, that was the distinction here. So, um, so there we are. That was the day of our flight. That was Charlie, Terry, and myself. So, um, when we got to Dallas, our first flight was DCA to Dallas, and we were met by the press. So, I didn't even have to do a walk around. The chief pilot met me and said. Go talk to the press. You don't have to do your walk around. I'll do the walk around for you. I said, oh, okay. And so they took us outside the airplane and they took this photo. In fact, uh, crew scheduler gave us a little flowers to wear that day. They flew up from Dallas the night before. They were so excited to be on the airplane. And so we took that. I guess that was our ship number, 708 Alpha Alpha. So we, um, so that was kind of fun. So it made, um, it made the press, it was big news at the time, so it was kind of fun, we were a day. Um, so the next photo, my mom, uh, my dad, and my brother went on the flight out of Reagan. So that was kind of fun to have them go on the flight. So my brother, they flew home that day. We went on our layover to Oak City, wherever we went. And so my brother at the time was a flight follower, kind of like a dispatcher for Colgan Airways in Manassas. And so he's pulling up the notice that day for the flights. And this is what he pulls up. DCA. Caution. <laughs> All female crew departing 12.39 at 6.48. Caution. All female crew arriving 12.30 at 1900. So I found this in my scrapbook to put this little speech together. And I called my brother. I said, Fred, did you make that up? 
He goes, no, that was really in there. <laughs> so I got a kick out of that one. So, so fast forward on the career, the little fun notes. I end up flying the right seat on the 727, which wasn't nearly as interesting as here, but it was a fun airplane to fly. I love flying. I'm very happy that I could say I flew the 727. Um, back then, the simulators weren't as good, so when you had to do your three takeoff and landings, when you were getting checked out in the airplane, our, 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 our training is out of Dallas Fort Worth. We go to West Texas in the middle of the night, and the airplane was sitting there doing nothing, and we fly around the pattern. We take turns in the right seat just doing our takeoff and landings to, to get current and to, to be able to fly the airplane. And then I end up flying the MD 80. And uh, by then, the simulators are better. So now the way it works is the first time you fly the airplane, the passengers are on board, which is crazy, but it's true. Um, <laughs> so I don't usually make that in the PA when I check out. And like, By the way, guys, this is my first time flying the airplane. I, do that. I, I leave that car out. Um, so uh, I'm checked out uh, as captain when I was 29 years old. I was the youngest woman to ever check out as captain with American Airlines. And um, and that's my dad. I got to attend the flight deck one time, so it was kind of fun. I was a nervous wreck. I happened to sit there, but it was so much fun, and mom was on the flight, too. So that was a special day. Um, we actually noticed, I'm still flying round, round dials here at a major airline. In fact, we used to use the ADF, which I found out they don't even train for anymore when you get your instrument rating. We would use the ADF over the AR routes, like going to Wilmington down to Florida, and then you just hope the controller just gave you a headache. <laughs> but we would use that. Um, it was four and a half years ago that I checked out on 737. So I have graduated to flight screens. I made the jump, and I learned all about VNAV just four and a half years ago. Right. So um, I graduated to the class. <laughs> so this is the max. We fly the, seven, eight, uh, the 737 800 in the max. And so this is the max screen there. So um, that is, I think, the end of my stories, but now I'm going to go on to the fun pictures. So let's see, eight. All right, I'm going to go on to the fun pictures now. This is a um, morning flight at DCA. I'm actually going to go out and do the pre-flight. Here's a funny story, because normally I don't do pre-flights. Typically, the captain doesn't do it unless you're feeling particularly generous or it's a lovely day and you want to get outside. But Southwest just had a fan engine, the, one of the fan, fan blades fail, so I really wanted to get out there and look myself. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I chose to do this. This, um, And then the ne next one is a pretty picture because it is actually the sun is right behind mm -hmm. looking in the engine. So it's one of my favorite cool. pictures there. Look in there. Okay. Um, this is, you may not know this. But in the um, the wheel, when the main gear go down, that's what's in between it. It's just the open wheel well down there. So you guys don't ever get probably see that from your perspective when you're looking at um, 737. And then this is uh, that Saturday when I flew, took the picture. Aaron, <coughs> pictures. This is the BWI, and that's just waiting in line there to get de-iced. And so here I am in Chicago, getting de-iced. The tub is pulling away. This is a couple weeks ago. And I tell them I have ice in my wheel well, and all of a sudden they spray my windshield. It's like, holy crap, I'm not gonna be able to see. So I turn to the first officer and say, You're like, and he's driving out. <laughs> but um, so I didn't expect this, but, but sometimes that stuff just streaks on your windshield. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a little video of getting de ice. And this is taking off. Oh, this is fun. Remember when the shuttle came into Dallas? The ground controller let me taxi the people by the air, so we open taxi by it. We taxi both ways up and back for people on both sides of the airplane. <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. Awesome. So that was kind of fun. Awesome. And then this is taking off at JFK. I flew from JFK to DCA. This Congo line of airplanes I'm in, I spent more time taxiing than I did flying to get home that day. But this is the sun setting over New York City. And of course, it's hard to get kids just look like a fire. It was, it was just beautiful, um, fire, fiery background there. Um, this is always going into Seattle. It's always fascinating to see Mount Rainier that just sticks up at your flight levels. It's fabulous. 
And uh, oh, this is Meteor Crater. That's in Winslow, Arizona. It's a mile wide from Meteor. It hit. I go to L I do a lot of LA transcon, so I get to see this on the way up to LA. This is Ships Rock when the settlers came. This is in New Mexico when they came across the country. They said, "Oh, there's a ship. We're there." Oh, sorry, you're only in yeah. New Mexico. We haven't quite made it yet. And then this is Hoover Dam. Oh, yeah. That's always a pretty sight to go over. And you can see the water level has really come down there a lot. And this, I think, is cool, the Rio Grande flying over Albuquerque. You can really see where the green is just around the river. And then it's desert. That's, oh, this is Washington, D.C. It's kind of cool. It's from the Anacostia, but we go to the RFK, looking down the river. And there's the airport over there. We don't get vectored over at that side very often. Of course, San Francisco and the Golden Gate Bridge is a classic aerial shot with Alcatraz. And this is really cool. This is the fastest ground speed I've ever had. It was 193 knots, so I took a picture of that. That's the fastest wind. This is the wind. That's the wind. That's the wind. And then the ground speed was 654. So that was, that was, that was a lot of wind that day. Uh, Oh, this is kind of neat. This is what the radar looks like. I've been taking, um, look like it's the way the radar looked in 737, and that's what it looked like out the window, just kind of for a comparison. And then you can see the anvil there. You, know, you want to stay away from this anvil. There could be a hail coming out the other way. You want to make sure you get down to see birth. And it's neat now. I have a HUD on the 737 with the flight path vector here, so I can see where my airplane's going. So I can see, actually, if I'm, you know, the cross with the winds, I can see actually where the airplane is going now. So that's a nice little tool I have that I used to have. Um, oh, this is St. Pablo's fire. I don't know if you've ever guys oh, ever seen cool. it on the windshield. <coughs> and the full with electricity just sort of dances around the windshield here at Thunderstorm. Wow. So, uh, Oh, air disaster response. I don't know what I would do. Okay. All right. And one other picture I want to show you here is uh, when you guys fly out of Leesburg, this is me. I took a screenshot of my iPad. I'm actually at 4,000 feet. I'm below Class B airspace. So keep in mind, the airliners can be below Class B airspace. And they don't necessarily slow you down. I slowed myself down because I know the speed limit. But um, so there could be airliners out there. And sometimes we think that, you know, that we're being vectored around. We're like King Tut. And so make sure you keep an eye out for yourself out there. I'm very aware of you guys now because of <laughs> Okay. And, um, oh, and this is my favorite photo. <laughs> this is in the MD-80. Abby came along and sat uh, on a Miami tour. I believe my mother was there. And so I love that picture in the flight deck. And so it's kind of fun that Abby is right seat there. And now I'm sitting right seat for her. <laughs> <laughs> so a plug for a book. Women have been airline pilots now for 40 years, and so in December, uh, just this past December, um, there was a pub bush book published, uh, a book, book collaboration of true stories, a bunch of true stories of women airline pilots. I want to contribute to it. You can get it on Amazon. All the proceeds go for a scholarship from a women in aviation, ISA 21. It's a, a social group of professional airline, women airline pilots. So uh, that just came out because it's been 40 years that I've been in the airline. So, okay, so here are my parting words of wisdom that I promised. So, you want to make sure you always mentally recover from any distractions that you have. The analogy would be you practice stall recovery, you recover from the stall, and then you keep flying. You always want to fly your airplane. Whether you have a weather mechanic, a weather issue, a mechanical issue, or most likely it's going to be a self-induced pilot error issue, don't let the problems compound. Leave it behind. Don't let that mistake that you made in the holding pattern leak into the approach. Um, and after the flight, so treat that after the flight, you want to talk to other pilots. Reflect and learn from your mistakes. Always learn. And we talk to other pilots and learn from their experiences because experience is valuable. 
Um, we call this hangar flying. And this is a nice venue, Smokehouse Pilot Club, to get together and meet <coughs> pilots. And uh, this is a great venue for that. You know, low, while low time pilots lack experiences, high time pilots can make up for it complacency. So whether you're, no matter your experience level, low time or high time, always use a checklist. So if you get distracted in something else, if you use your checklist discipline and go back and use your checklist, that's going to keep you safe and it's going to help you to back to focus and just fly your airplane. So you want to recover from your mistakes like you would recover from a stall. Talk to other pilots and always use your checklist. That looks like an acronym. Another aviation acronym. S P C. Smokehouse Pilots Club. <laughs>